Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Bible study, the day after or week after Christmas. Uh, the week of Christmas, I guess you should say. Or the week after would be next week, wouldn't it? Hope everybody had a good Christmas. Thanks for joining us online. For those of you who aren't with us in person, uh, just a reminder, uh, as we go into the cold and the snow starts flying as it has, uh, we in a, this community have a warming shelter for those who are less fortunate and need a place to go. Uh, we Once the temperature hits a certain level, the warming shelter opens, uh, provides people a place to stay. It's called Room at the Inn. And if you would like uh, to be a volunteer, to be part of that um, service that we offer to folks in our community, uh, there are brochures out in the lobby that you can pick up. Uh, there's a QR code there. You just scan the QR code, and it'll take you to an application to sign up. And you'll only get called if uh, there is, uh, once the temperature hits, I can't remember what the temperature is, like 20 degrees or something like this. Um, and uh, gives people a place to clean up, um, sleep, and gives them a safe place to stay uh, throughout the winter. So if you'd like to be a part of that, it's a great opportunity to give back to those who are certainly less fortunate than us. Uh, I've got a few prayer requests uh, that have come in already tonight. Uh, Mary Melanowski is sick. We want to pray for her. Ask the Lord to be with her. Stephen Williams uh, has covid and uh, is at home, so we want the Lord to touch him, give him a quick recovery. And uh, of course, we want to remember our guys at MCC with um, uh, Mike and Julie uh, having service uh, there on Wednesday nights at MCC. Anybody else have a prayer request? We want to, Jesse. Let's pray for Jesse's mom. Uh, has had COVID and has a surgery coming up. We want the Lord to uh, give her that opportunity. Amen. Somebody else? Anybody else? All right. If you're online, you want to key that into the comments. We'll pray with you as well. Let's stand and ask the Lord to take these needs. Lord, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for bringing us together tonight to study your word. Pray, Lord, that you would minister to the needs that we have before us. You see where we are. You know who these folks are. Pray that you be with Sharon tonight. Lord, speed her recovery. Give her a release. You see the surgery that's coming up on her knee. We pray that you would prepare that as it needs to be. We commit Mary and Stephen into your hands. You see what Mary's condition is. We pray that you would minister to her right now. Lord, send recovery, quick recovery to Stephen. Let his symptoms decrease. Let health come back to his body. We thank you for releasing him. Lord, you see this uh, virus that is going through our community. We pray that you would protect us, keep us, Lord, from this, this, this virus and this sickness. We ask you to be our mercy, be our strength today. Lord, we pray for Mike and Julie. Pray for our guys at MCC tonight. Let your spirit minister to them. Lord, we thank you for overshadowing them with your grace and mercy. Give them favor with the administration, Lord, their fellow inmates. We thank you for pouring out your spirit at MCC. Bless Mike and Julie, Lord. Meet their needs. Speak through them. Let them be an encouragement to these guys. We thank you for your good work today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Just a reminder throughout the week, uh, we're praying uh, through Isaiah 9 and 6, and this week we're praying that he let that Prince of Peace be over us, covering our mind, no matter what this year brings before us, ask the Lord to be our Prince of Peace, cover us, and if you don't get the uh, text messages, uh, you can let me know or let Jesse know, uh, we send out a weekly prayer focus uh, so that you know what we're praying for each week. You've got that there on your phone. You can remind yourself of it. All right. Uh, thanks again for being here. I say this every week, but I appreciate you guys uh, coming out on a Wednesday night and um, putting this hour, making this hour sacred, I should say, and allowing 
us to uh, get into the word together. We're going to be talking through uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 is where our focus verse is. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we're talking today, as is apt for this time of year, talking about worship, the gifts of worship. We're going to be working our way through Matthew and Luke, uh, talking about the gift of worship that we have given that, that we are able to give back to the Lord and using the Magi from uh, Matthew and Luke as our examples. It is good for us to worship the Lord at all times. The scripture says that our pra- his praise should continually be in our mouths. Uh, I want you to think about the we're just walking. We're just walking away from from the the largest gift giving experience in. Uh, I, I don't know. I I was going to say the West, but certainly around the world, doesn't matter if it's a Muslim nation or not. Uh, Christmas is a big deal. Uh, it's a massive money making experience for um, for businesses. A big spending experience, people going into debt to give good gifts. I'm wondering what your biggest sacrifice was or has been to give a gift to someone you love. Somebody has given, you You. Uh, you were like, I'm going to dig deep to make sure my kid has this. Or uh, maybe it was a, a, a spouse or a significant other. You wanted to make sure that they had whatever it is that perfect dress or that ring or that car, or maybe it was just something really special, just a nice little thing. You don't have to share, but you know what you've, you know some of the sacrifices that you've made sometimes as parents that we've made to make sure that our kids get uh, something that lets them know that they're thought of, that they're special to us, that they mean something to us. Um, I was watching this year as people were posting about their kids' gift lists and the slide decks that they were creating in PowerPoint or in Google Slides, uh, having QR codes and hyperlinks. And uh, I, I saw a number of families who sat down around uh, a projection screen to get their children's presentation of what their gifts, gift requests would be. We're a long way from the J.C. Penney catalog, the Sears catalog for some of our older folks, the, uh, the, the scratched out list on a, on a napkin. We, we've moved forward for sure. Uh, this is not what our worship, our gift to the Lord should be. Not, certainly not a laundry list of requests. Worship we're going to talk about and praise are not request-driven, but they are individual-driven of who he is and what he means to us. Have you ever come to church uh, gritting your teeth, just kind of, uh, you feel about as spiritual as a, a reptile or a rodent? And, and you drag yourself into church, just, okay, I'm here, fine. You stomp in the door and drop into a seat and, all right, go. I'll be perfectly honest, that has been me on several occasions where you're like, oh, no, I'm here and that's about all I can get. And then by the end of the service, you're like, man, I am super glad I showed up today. I needed to hear that, or I needed to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, I wasn't able to get into the presence of the Lord myself, but somebody else got into the presence of the Lord, and I just kind of got like a a little bit of a splash over experience from from them. And, And you leave excited to see maybe something has happened in the service, or you've heard a testimony, and you're just excited to see what's going to, what's, what's happening next? What can God do next? Your faith has increased, and maybe like the shepherds, on that Bethlehem evening, they go running out of that cave or that stable, whatever that was that they found the Lord in, 
worshiping God and you head off into the parking lot and into the rest of your week thinking, man, I serve a great God. The, 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 the shepherds, whenever they showed up there, uh, there, were, there was no haze, there was no lights, there had been no practice with the worship team. They just showed up having heard that there was a promise and we want to see it. Now, granted, their worship team was a little bit bigger than anything anybody else has ever experienced before. It set the bar pretty high. But we think of worship as what's the musicians look like? What's the singing look like? Is somebody running the aisles? Did somebody bounce off the wall, making the corner? Biblical worship is not just a singular experience within a, a, a church service. It's not a, a period of time, but it's a totality of who you are as a Christian. As, as an individual, what are you in your life looking like in our faith and in our trust and our response to God's nature as to who he is? That is what worship looks like not just a moment in time. Even our holiness, and we, the, the past few weeks we talked about what holiness looks like and holiness in our lives looks like being purified, being set apart in our thoughts and our activities and, and what we look like and speak like and act like. That's rooted in our response in worship to what God is doing in our lives. If you... You look one way, but you act another, or you sound one way, but you present yourself in another way. There's a question as to whether or not your life is reflecting or worshiping God and showing him through you. God told the Israelites that they needed to be holy because he himself, in Leviticus, he says, I am holy. So I'm calling you to be holy and the form of worship that we take should reflect the holiness of the God that we serve. Uh, we, we, we got our winter wonderland a little late. Uh, I was super happy to see some snow. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause for a moment. We have Ray uh, Taylor, my uncle, my mom's brothers in the house. Thank you for being here. Made the drive up from Houston. They don't get this on a regular basis. And we just went around our day and like, oh, isn't it pretty? And this would have caused mayhem down south. I'm, I'm glad that we got some snow. And whether it's in the desert or uh, it's on the beach with the, the waves lapping against the shore. I had some friends that were spent the weekend in, or spent the, the week last week in, in the, the Caribbean for their Christmas. Whatever the landscape looks like, Christmas has a very specific time uh, in our minds of year. And we expect that we're going to spend some time with some family or, or we're going to relive some old memories. Maybe uh, the, the goose that got cooked or got burned or the, the event that went sideways. And we look at the, the time past... Christmas past, we get all excited about Christmas present, and by February, we're thinking about Christmas future, right? And this season, from a kid's perspective, now as an adult, it kind of changes, but from a kid's perspective, it is all about the, the awe and the wonder of Christmas, the what the, the holidays are going to bring. We're skipping school, we're getting gifts, there's lots of food, there's lights and prettiness. And it's good for us to remember from a childhood what it looks like as an adult. And it's also good for us to remember the reason for the season. Why are we doing this? It's because we're called to remember the miraculous that brought this event together. Now, I know we can say, uh, you know, the December 25th, Jesus was not born on December 25th. Well, I, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And, and, and we don't know the exact year 
we have a perspective of, of time frame, but this in our Western culture is when we have set aside to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. And it's good for us to pause and to celebrate that. Now, I understand that we have, uh, we, some of us have taken a left turn at celebrations and it's become extra, extraordinary for our temporal experience. But certainly, we need to pause and take account of what has brought us to this point. It's not the tinsel, but it is the Savior. We have a Savior, and this is the reason that we focus our attention in this time on who we are as Christians. Really, this is the playoffs. This is... This is the beginning headed toward the Super Bowl of Easter for us as Christi in, in Christianity. Without the reason for the season, we have no experience on Easter, and we have nothing happening, and 50 days later is the day of Pentecost. So absolutely, we should celebrate this time and celebrate what it means from a scriptural perspective perspective. These characters in the, in the Christmas story that we celebrate with bathrobes and, and uh, little nativity scenes, they didn't just believe in the Messiah, that there was a possibility, that there was an, a promise that he was coming, and it could be at any time. But they acted on what they believed, and we are called to worship just as they did we're called to respond in a very similar way. I wonder if there's been a time that you've had faith for something that seemed absolutely impossible. There's no way this is going to happen. I have no idea how this is going to work out, but I know it's possible if God gets involved in it. I have a prayer request that I am praying regularly for an individual that is an absolute impossibility. And I'm exercising, I'm stretching my, my faith muscles every time I pray for this individual because I want to see this individual baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And it is an impossibility in my eyes. I don't know how this is ever going to happen. How, is his, how will the, the, his mindset change? How will he find a, a, make a turn and, and point himself toward Calvary? How is it possible? It's not possible in my hands. It's not possible. And this is what, the, 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 if you put yourself 2,000 years ago, how is it possible that the Messiah is going to show up? How is he going to fulfill all of these uh, amazing prophecies? How will it happen? It's not possible in ourselves. But with him, all things are possible. And the Christmas story that we have celebrated up to today is a call to exercise faith. It's a call to faith because the characters in, this, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke uh, saw things happen that could only happen through the miraculous, and it increased faith exponentially. Let's go to Gabriel appearing to Mary. There's going to be two babies born, miracle babies. You're going to have a baby, and, and your cousin, Elizabeth, is going to have a baby. And these are on polar opposites. We're talking wide spectrum. Virgin not married, old lady. Miraculous births. Gabriel says to Mary, you're highly favored. She's a virgin. She's going to give birth to the Son of God through the Holy Spirit. This is in Luke 1.28. And then Elizabeth, she's already six months pregnant, the, the, the angel tells her absolutely illogical, absolutely impossible. How is this going to be happening? Mary didn't understand IVF. It wasn't an option 2,000 years ago. She doesn't even have a perspective on this. All things are possible. All things are possible. Exercise your faith in whom you have 
believed. Look, I want you to notice each cast member in our story and how they accept the proclamation of the angels or the prophecies by faith. We have Mary, we have Joseph, we have Elizabeth, we have Elizabeth's husband, we have the shepherds, we have the wise men, we have the scribes, the scribes who point the wise men to Bethlehem. We're looking in the scriptures, and the scriptures say it's going to be in Bethlehem. So we're going to trust what the scriptures say and send these guys to a backwater town that has no significance whatsoever. Faith leads each one of these in this group, just like it does today, to a place of worship. Each one of these individuals, each one of these groups, end up worshiping at the feet of their Savior. Now, of course, we have this advantage today. We have an advantage today over the characters that we read about in the story because we see it from a 30,000-foot view. We're, we're looking at it from uh, in the rearview mirror, knowing how the story turns out, We know that the Lord came down to earth to be born as a baby. We know how it all runs out all the way through Golgotha and then to the day of Pentecost. We know this. So it's easy for us to say, well, of course, this is the way it's going to work out. Put yourself in their shoes. Or maybe where are you right now in your own life? Where are you right now in the situation that you're dealing with? Is it an impossibility? And what's going to happen in your history that hasn't been written yet that someone's going to say, well, of course, Eddie, that's the way it was going to work. Of course, that's the way it was going to turn out. Of course, God was going to do that. But in the moment, in the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew of silence, that's where worship comes into play, by faith. Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth hears Mary's voice. And in that moment, the scripture says that her, the the child who was John the Baptist leaps inside of her, filled with the Holy Ghost, Luke 141 says. And she immediately calls Mary blessed, says, you're the mother of my Lord. And it's not clear from from Luke's account whether or not Mary tells her all of what's going on, but you know she probably did. I mean, this is, there was all kinds of things going on in her life. And so she, she probably told her everything that had, had transpired in order to get her to where she is. But Mary, uh, Elizabeth knew from the moment she saw Mary walk in the door, this is something brand new. It's going to change everything for us. Shepherds show up at the birth of Jesus They've had the angels tell them, go into Bethlehem. You're going to find the baby there. They run, find them, see for themselves, and they respond in Luke 2 and 20 by glorifying and praising God. And we should experience the same type of wonder. Not the, not the kid wonder of like Christmas tree on, on, the, on Christmas morning full of presents or whatever the case may be, your Amazon gift card recharged the wonder of experiencing God's presence. I can't believe that he forgave me. I can't believe that he washed me. I can't believe that he provided for me in this way. Isn't he awesome? When we look at the Lord in the scriptures and we read it through faith, we're experiencing him in the historical, but we are living out the same experiences that those in that we're reading about experienced him as well. When we are encountering the Lord in a face-to-face basis, like those in the Old Testament never, never had the opportunity to do in the general population, when we're experiencing him and we're engulfed in his presence, 
driving down the road or in our prayer closet or sitting in a, in a group of people worshiping the Lord, that is an opportunity for that wonder to renew. And we can be in awe of his greatness and in awe of his love and moved to action to do something as a result and certainly moved to worship him. I'm sure, just like me, you've had an opportunity to be overwhelmed with the presence of God. Sometimes for me, it's, it's I'm, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm, 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 I'm reading the scripture or I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing just some research on, on a concept of the Lord. And, and I, I remember one day I was sitting at my desk and just a wave of God's presence washed over me. And I began to just weep sitting at my desk thinking, if anybody walks in, they're going to be like, what is going on? There's, there, you're, you're not on your knees. You're just sitting at your desk. But the presence of the Lord was so overwhelming, and, and it was so sweet. And what I was reading about, what I was um, uh, uh, ingesting into myself made such a, a difference in my life. I was in awe. I sat in wonder. Worship has to do something. We're going to talk about James here now and in a little bit in this lesson. It, James says in 2 and 20 that faith without works is dead. you got to do something with what you have. And so our response to when we believe and when we experience God's spirit is a result of our faith. I have experienced God's presence, and thus I'm going to move to do something about what I feel. Matthew's talking about the Christmas story. He talks about the, the wise men coming from the east to find Jesus. Scripture says that they'd seen his star and wanted to find him and worship him, and they had faith to believe at the end of this journey we're going to find this king that we're searching for. This is an expedition that they set out upon. Just like going to the top of Everest, I've got faith that in my gear, in my Sherpa, that we're going to make it to the top and I'm going to summit. These guys had faith to believe we're going to see something, and they follow this to find the king of the Jews, and they lay down, fall down, and worship him. They believed in whom they sought. They believed in whom they had sought for, and when they got into the presence of the Messiah, even that child, even that, 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 that baby cradled in that mother's arms was enough of an impact to drive those men who were probably extraordinarily wealthy, rulers in their own kingdoms, to their knees. This is us when we are in his presence, compelled to worship him. It's a natural outward expression of our faith. Let's define worship. So praise, uh, I'll read this because I, I, I found this quote and I think it's fantastic. Praise is about God. Worship is to God. Praise is opening up Worship is entering in. Praise is boldly declaring. Worship is humbly bowing in the presence of a holy God. Praise applauds what God has done. Worship is honoring God for who he is. So we can praise the Lord because he provided for us. But we worship the Lord because he is God Almighty and deserves all of our worship. He deserves everything. There should be nothing above him. And so we can stop and say, Lord, you are everything to me. You mean everything. You are my God. And I submit to your authority. That's where that bowing becomes. You don't have to physically bow, although sometimes we do. We're, in the presence of the Lord, we are, we are driven to our knees. But we can tell him, Lord, I'm submitting my life to you. I'm submitting my authority to you. I'm honoring you with my life. And let's talk about what that looks like. When we give gifts to people at Christmas, 
we put some thought into it, or at least that's the idea. Otherwise, the thought doesn't count, right? So we've, we've done some thinking, and we've, we've sussed out what their need is, or in, 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 from my perspective, Christmas is all about giving gifts that, that you wouldn't get for yourself. So uh, it's that tool that you never would spring for, or it's that, that uh, uh, whatever that, that just was just outside of reach, or maybe it was just, yeah, I'll, I'll push that off till later. And somebody says, I, I heard you talking about this, and I wanted to give this to you as a gift. And you're like, oh, that's just what I was hoping for. I didn't even, didn't even that's just, just not even on my list. You're so cool to do this. Gift giving is a love language. And some of us are really fluent in that language. And other of us, that doesn't do anything for us. You give me stuff, I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. We'll put it on the shelf. Okay, we're done with that. Moving on. It's not our love language. But for those of us who have that love language of giving, it means an awful lot to provide something to somebody. God's, God speaks a lot of languages, and one of his love languages is his giving. I want to give something to you. When we receive something, you should feel loved. You should feel like somebody thought about me, and they thought enough about me to put something together, to go out of their way, and to show their appreciation for me. Show we care. Care enough to sacrifice. I'm going to take some of my resources and pull them out of my pocket and put them into yours. On Tuesdays in November, the end of November, Tuesday, the last Tuesday in November, back in 2012, I think it was, there was an organization in New York City called the 92nd 90, 90 uh, Y, 92 Street Y. Is that right? 96 and Street Y. So it's kind of like a YMCA, except it was originally started in the early 1900s for uh, Hebrew people, Jewish people. And they decided in 2012 that we're going to start a day of giving. And we're going to do all kinds of giving. We're going to, it's going to be donations. We're going to go out into the community and help people out. And from 2012 until today, it has become a massive event. And some of you may be familiar with Giving Tuesdays. Uh, if, if you're not, this was uh, organizations all over the, the world have taken this Tuesday, and the last Tuesday in November, on as a day where you can uh, give of yourself, of your time, of your resources, get out into the community, help out your neighbor. Uh, lots of uh, nonprofits use this as an opportunity for fundraising. Uh, in Colombia, there's a massive Giving Tuesday event where uh, there's all kinds of activities throughout the week of that last week of November. We are called on by all kinds of entities to give of ourselves, United Way, Red Cross, et cetera, et cetera. We in this church give you opportunities to give to Global Missions, Compassion Services International, et cetera, North American Missions, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of opportunities to give, and as a result, that giving should increase someone else, but also be a blessing to you as well. But we have to remember what we're actually giving to in all of those opportunities. We're giving to humanity when we're giving to National Public Radio or to the Red Cross or whatever, but when we're giving to global missions, that's to the Lord. We're giving to the kingdom. We're giving to fulfill that call to, to, to spread the gospel, to share the gospel. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking about a guy giving good gifts to his children. And he says, if your kid asks for a fish, you're not going to give him a snake. If he asks for bread, you're not going to give him stones. And even the evil ones among us know how to give good gifts. And they're going to post it on Instagram to show how good of a, of a dad they are. Even if they never show up the rest of the year, I'm going to show you how good of a dad I am because of all the stuff that I gave to my kids. 
And he goes on to say in 11, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? God loves to give. And he wants us to reciprocate that giving, not just to those around us, but back upwards. He's passing down our vertical response is worship and reciprocating his love by giving back to them. We acknowledge him. We give back to him by acknowledging who he is, his goodness, his mercy to us, and honoring him for who he is. He deserves our worship. He deserves the, the, those who have believed on him and who have been saved by him, who've experienced his holiness, we, we should give back to him in worship and praise. And we give back to God through our worship and through our humility and our reverence for him. You know, many times we refer to uh, kind of the, 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 the behind the scenes, so to speak. We refer to our worship uh, section of our service is our, our worship set. Uh, maybe it's the, um, the song set or something like this in an in a industry terminology. In fact, if you go to our YouTube page uh, on the, the Sunday service, you'll see links that say in the description to the sermon and to the worship set. So you can click on that link and it'll take you directly there in your, um, in your browser. When we think about worship as just simply lifting our hands or clapping, hopefully on beat with the, the rhythm of the song or, or, or standing or sitting, depending on how we feel, how emotional we are about that particular song or if we approve of that song or not. If that's all we're doing in our worship, then we are missing out on the majority of what worship looks like. Because just having one experience in this, in this four walls with a sound system and a drummer is not at all what worship entails. It's a minute experience. Let's, let's, let's define this as Merriam-Webster says it is. Re reverence offered to a divine being or a supernatural power or an act of expressing such reverence. So in just simple terms, worship is an outward expression of our respect or our devotion to God. And what does that really look like? Well, let's go back to our wise men. The Bible says that they worshiped. So they bowed before Jesus. And while that, that physical motion is, was there, it was, it's documented that that happened, it represented a lot more. It was much more deep than just the physical motion, but it is the humility. I'm humbling myself before this individual that I'm bowing to. This is why whenever people meet the Queen of England, you're required to curtsy if you're a lady or you, you bow as a, as a man. You're, you're showing reverence to the position of that individual, that monarch, now the king, I guess, of England, uh, you're, you're showing reverence to that, that position, regardless of the individual. When we worship the king of kings, we're laying down our pride and our selfishness, our honor, our reputation, who we are as individuals, and placing our status on the back burner to put him on the throne. This is why in the Hebrews... Uh, it, it, the Hebrews in the, in the book of Daniel refused to bow in those two experiences. One, the, the Hebrew children facing the, the statue and, and getting thrown into the furnace, and Daniel continuing to pray even though he was required by law not to and ends up in the lion's den. The reason was is because I'm not going to trade that reverence for the physical for what I have for the eternal. I'm not going to put the eternal underneath what that physical king is. That, that worship is reserved for him, my king of kings only. And I'm not going to trade that off. I recognize who you are in my status 
my pride, my position in my mind or in life is insignificant in light of who you are in eternity. Throughout the the Christmas story, we see people humbling themselves so God's will could be accomplished, perhaps in their own life personally or in the global scheme of the story in general. Of course, we have the most prominent is Jesus himself humbling himself to the point of a child, humbling himself to the point of being ridiculed and then being uh, hung on a cross. We see him humbling himself to wash his disciples' feet, humbling himself to to stand down whenever his family would uh, try to... to, uh, uh, push him away, say that he had no respect there. And his humility, hard as it is sometimes, is supposed to be our example. I want you to think about ways that you can display humility, and I want you to think about some hard ways. I circled the parking lot for 10 minutes trying to get to that spot, and now you've taken it. I've been ha- I had my eye on it out there on, on 24 when I was pulling in, and I knew that was my spot, and you took it. Humility. Humility sometimes is keeping our mouth shut whenever we really have a good comeback. I know exactly what I'm going to say. And, uh, 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 uh. Humility sometimes is being quiet to listen when all we want to do is talk. Humility is sometimes taking the low road, taking the high road. What does Mojo Obama say? They go low, we go high. Taking the high road when you really want to get down in the mud and scrap. Humility, that humble beginning of the stable versus the palace. That is, that's our example. We can go back to the temptation. Temptation of Jesus appeals to all the things that appeal to us and to our flesh. Pride of life, hunger. What is it that's driving you as an individual? Question that in response to humility in the presence of God. Of course, giving, I've I've mentioned this already, but I want to come back to it. Another way that we serve God or we worship the Lord in humility is through our giving. The, the, The wise men didn't just show up and bow down, but they gave something of themselves. Verse 11 says they opened their treasures, as we read already, presented them with the myrrh, the frankincense, and the gold. Of course, worship comes from our heart, but our actions are a manifestation of what's happened in our heart. And there are times whenever the Lord moves on us to give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. And our treasure sometimes can be very difficult to give up. Same thing for our time. I don't want to share that with you. I don't want to give of that time frame that's precious to me. And in our humility, we say, I'm going to open that door and allow you to have access to all of these areas of my life. Wise men gave of their riches. You know what those shepherds did? They left their entire income, their, all their livelihood. In fact, their future was left in those fields when they walked away to find the Savior. You realize that? We always run from the fields with them, and we're all shouting and screaming, and oh, it's so awesome, we're going to go see Jesus. But they had to leave something on the hillside that meant the world to them in order to find Jesus. What what would the Lord ask of you to leave on the hillside to go glorify him someplace else?
when we're submitted to the Lord, when we've submitted our authority, when we've submitted ourselves into his hands, it's easier, mm, we're more willing to give those things up whenever he calls on us. This is what Paul says to the church in Corinth whenever he's saying to them, hey, I'm coming to visit you, and I've, I know you've got a gift that you had promised, you had pledged to give to those who are less fortunate than you. I'm headed your direction, and I just want to remind you, God loves a cheerful giver. And so whenever I come to pick up your gift, I want you to be prepared, willing to give. The Lord wants us to give to him not out of duty, but out of love. And when we humble ourselves to him by willingly giving of our time, our treasure, and our talents to the work of the kingdom, we're going to find that he sprinkles some kind of miraculous into it and spreads it a lot further. And those five loaves and two fishes become so much more than we ever could have done with it on our own. This is what it looks like to worship the king. We're going to take a break real quick uh, and hear of what a different form of giving looks like to the kingdom. Oftentimes, when we hear the word worship, our minds go to thinking about music and singing and all the wonderful moments we spend lifting our hands and our voices in God's presence. While those things are certainly wonderful expressions of our worship, the Bible seems to point to an even deeper level of worship, one that goes beyond our outward expressions because it flows out from a heart postured for sacrifice. The very first time the word worship in the Bible is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 22. It is here that we see the Lord ask Abraham to place his son Isaac on the altar, the very son that God promised would make Abraham the father of many nations. God is now asking Abraham to sacrifice him. Most of us would have questioned God or perhaps even argued or disobeyed. But Abraham did no such thing. The Bible says that he rose early, saddled the animals, and began his journey. In verse 5, he makes the powerful statement, the lad and I will go worship. In the end, we know that God did not allow Abraham to sacrifice his son. That was never God's intention in the first place. God wasn't after Isaac, he was after Abraham's heart. And likewise, God wants our hearts. Worship means giving God what matters to you most. It is giving God full right to your heart and your treasures. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The act of giving is more than just an outward act. When we give of our resources to the kingdom, we are telling the Lord that His kingdom is more important than our own personal treasures. When our hearts are postured toward being a living sacrifice, there's nothing we aren't willing to give back to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 makes a powerful statement about how our lives should be offered as a living sacrifice and that this is simply our reasonable act of service or worship. When the Magi came from the East, they fell down and worshiped Jesus and they brought very special gifts, all pointing toward his royalty, his deity, and his future as our ultimate sacrifice. They came simply with hearts full of praise. These expressions of worship are equally valuable because their hearts were set on bringing glory and honor to the Lord. The wise men's gifts were valuable, but their hearts were more valuable. The shepherd's praise was valuable because they fully trusted in God, following the words of the angels, and eventually becoming the first to declare the good news to others. Giving of our time, our energy, our financial resources, our obedience, and our praise are all valuable acts of worship that point to a kingdom that's greater than this world, declares Jesus to be the king of our hearts, the king of our treasures, and the one who is worthy of it all. I love that line. God wasn't after Isaac, but he was after Abraham's heart. I love that. I want to still go back to James chapter 2, and I know this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, James talking about uh, faith, but I want you to think of it from in, in the, the, the framework that we've had tonight of honoring and respecting and reverencing the Lord. So James chapter 2, this is starting in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith alone save him? 
If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, thoughts and prayers in our current parlance, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also by faith, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you know, want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? This is what she was just talking about. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? For the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot who also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If we're going to have faith in the Lord, if we're going to believe that he is, the, Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews says, then we're going to do something with that faith, and that faith is going to put him right here. He rightfully belongs as our King of kings, our Lord of lords, and our reverence to him is a natural outcrop, an offshoot of that faith. My faith says you are who you are, and thus you deserve, and I'm going to give you everything that you are accountable for. We have this beautiful picture of, of, uh, in the Christmas story of all these people laying themselves at the feet of the, uh, of the Messiah. We have the, the shepherds leaving their sheep to praise God. We have the wise men laying down their possessions and worship. And then we have Mary, who gave up everything. She put everything on the line to lose everything when Gabriel's announcement comes to her. She's going to lose her reputation. She's going to lose her potential of marriage. She's going to lose any prospect of her future by accepting what the angel says to her. Now, you could say, well, come on, an angel showed up and asked her to do that. It's kind of hard to pass that up. You have the law and the prophets. It's kind of hard to pass that up. Luke 138, she says, Behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me, or I submit to your will, whatever your word is. Joseph, the same way, could have given up everything. What society, what are they going to say on social media when they find out Mary's pregnant? What are they going to say about me? I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to lose my family. What if they, what's going to happen? Everything from reputation to pride to future to possessions, they were willing to give up everything in order to allow God's plan to be fulfilled in their lives. We like to give to others. It's another thing to ask you to give up everything everything. But this is exactly what the Lord did for us. As I wrap this up, I want to read to you from a sermon by a very ancient preacher. This is Augustine of Hippo. He's a North African bishop, which would now be in Algeria. He lived from 354 to 430 AD. And this is from one of his sermons called the maker of man became man. The word of the father by whom all time was created was made flesh and born in time for us. He, without whose divine permission no day completes its course, wished to have one day set aside for his human birth. 
In the bosom of his father, he existed before all the cycles of the ages. Born of an earthly mother, he entered upon the course of the years on this day. The maker of man became man, that he, ruler of the stars, might be nourished at his mother's breast. That he, the bread, might hunger. That he, the fountain, might thirst. That he, the light, might sleep. The way might be wearied by the journey. The truth might be accused by false witnesses. The judge of the living and dead might be brought to trial by a mortal judge. That justice might be condemned by the unjust. That discipline might be scourged with whips. That the foundation might be suspended on a cross that courage might be weakened, that the healer would be wounded, that life might die. To endure these and similar indignities for us, to free us unworthy creatures, he who existed as the Son of God before all ages, without a beginning, designed to become the Son of Man these recent years, he did all this, although he who submitted to such evils for our sake had done no evil, and although we, who were the recipients of such good at his hands, had done nothing to merit these benefits. Begotten by the Father, but not born, he was made man in the woman whom he himself had made, so that he might exist here for a while, sprung from her who could never and nowhere have existed except through his power. So an ancient text from an ancient preacher, and we'll wrap with that. Our God deserves all our praise. Stand with me tonight. I want us to pray tonight as we wrap this up that our faith would be increased that we would know the Lord in a greater fashion than we've ever known him before, that he would be revealed to us and to those around us, that we would be able to experience the wonder of his glory. Ask you, the Lord, to reveal areas of your life that you haven't submitted to him, that you haven't given him control over. Ask the Lord to minister to you tonight. I ask you, I, I, I see a text message that I got just a little bit ago. Uh, I want you to pray for Lisa Husky. has been very sick the past couple of days. She's online with us tonight. We're going to pray for you, Lisa, and ask the Lord to touch you. Lord, I thank you today for who you are. I praise you, Lord, for your great works. Lord, your majesty, you have spoken and created. Lord, we, we can't imagine your greatness. We can't imagine your depth and your breadth. We will never plumb the, the, the length of who you are. I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to renew a relationship with your creation, that you didn't just walk away from what you had set in motion, but you are intimately involved in us. Lord, I thank you for revealing yourself in a greater way than we've ever seen you before. Lord, we have your word, and we're so thankful for it. It's powerful. Lord, it, it, it pulls us apart. Lord, it heals us. Lord, we want to see you in all your majesty. Lord, I thank you for revealing yourself in our city and our community, Lord, in our families, in us. And Lord, let us reflect that love. Let us reflect that wonder and awe that we have for you. Lord, let it reflect to those around us, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for seeing us as we are, shining the light of, of your love your conviction into our lives. If there's an area in our heart that we haven't revealed, we haven't re relinquished to you, I pray that we give it to you today. We submit to your authority, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your good work in us. Lord, I thank you for touching Lisa. Thank you for strengthening her body. Lord, I thank you for restoring health to her tonight. I thank you for being her helper today. Thank you for your blessing and strength in us as we leave this place, bring us back together in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you tonight. We will see you on Sunday. Thank you for being in Bible study again tonight. Merry Christmas. Amen.